Gone are the days when it was part of the rhetorical repertoire of many American politicians to proclaim that U.S. health care is the best in the world. Whether that was ever true or not, this proud and optimistic statement did take on the gloss of a truism. But it's not something that many people are saying anymore. Although they are saying that there, there are ways that the system can become the best. But first, we have to get to the bottom of what's gone wrong and to figure out just how busted the system is. Is there anything salvageable to build on? Or is it so broken that we need to erase what's there and start over with a clean slate? Well, that sounds like the makings of a debate, so let's have it. Yes or no to this statement. The U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. A debate from Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan. We are in Rochester, Minnesota, in partnership with the Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation and its Transform Conference. As always, our debate will go in three rounds, and then the audience here in Rochester will vote to choose the winner, and only one side wins. What we'd like to do now is have you go to your phones and vote to tell us where you stand on this motion before you've heard any of the arguments. After you've heard all of the arguments at the end of the debate, we have you vote a second time. And this time, what we do is compare the difference between the first and the second votes. And the winner of our debates is the team whose numbers have moved up the most in percentage point terms between the first and the second vote. Our motion is the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. Let's meet our debaters. First, the team arguing for the motion. Please welcome Shannon Brownlee. Thank you. Thank you. And Shannon, uh, you are a senior vice president of the Lown Institute and a visiting scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. You are co-founder of the Right Care Alliance. That's a network of activist patients clinicians and community leaders. My question to you is, how important is, is it to have grassroots support in healthcare reform? It, it's absolutely essential. The system isn't gonna change itself from inside and it's gonna need outside pressure and that should be communities, it should be activists, physicians, it should be patients, it should be everybody who's involved in healthcare and that's everybody. Okay, sounds like a little bit of a look ahead at your argument tonight. Thank you for that and please tell us who your partner is. Oh, my partner is my friend and esteemed colleague, Robbie Pearl, an author of a great book, Mistreated. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Pearl. Please welcome Robert Pearl. I was just pointed out, the full title of your book, uh, Mistreated, Why We Think We're Getting Good Healthcare and Why We're Usually Wrong. Uh, you're a doctor, Robert, who also has been hugely successful running a major corporation. So tell us, is, is there anything about getting a medical education, anything at all that you can then apply to running a business? There's so much. It's the scientific method of analysis. It's the importance of innovation. It's the mission-driven foundation for everything that's successful. That's why I teach at both the Stanford Graduate School of Business and Medical School. And you've also proved a success at it. Thanks very much. And to the team again, let's welcome one more time the team arguing for the motion. And that motion to remind you the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. We have two uh, debaters arguing against it. Please first welcome Ezekiel Emanuel. Zeke, I want to point out that you're, you've come out with a new book. It's called Prescription for the Future, The 12 Transformational Practices of Highly Effective Medical Organizations. It was our staff's discovery of that book that actually led to this debate. It inspired us to give some deep thought to how we could structure a debate. We reached out to you. You were very collaborative in helping us think it through and find dividing lines, so we want to thank you for that, thank first you. of all. This is your second time with Intelligence Squared US. It's great to have you back. Uh, and you got huge attention back in 2014 when you declared back then that as far as you're concerned, the age of 75 is a perfectly adequate lifespan and that you would take no extraordinary efforts to live beyond that age. But you've also said that you expect American healthcare to improve substantially by the year 2030, which is 13 years from now. So does that change your mind about this dying at 75 thing? No. <laughs> Let's be, I'm living a very full and fulfilling life, and I haven't had my first grandchild, but I haven't changed my mind one iota. Because you always stick by your guns. No, no. not a foolish consistency, <laughs> but 75 is still a full life. All right, thank you, Zeke Emanuel, and please tell us who your partner is. Oh, David Feinberg. He's uh, CEO of Geisinger Healthcare and uh, one of the more brilliant leaders in American healthcare today. David uh, Feinberg, welcome to Intelligence Squared, and let's thank give you. you a round of applause to welcome you here. Thank you. 
Um, and David, uh, as he pointed out, you're CEO of Geisinger, and under your leadership, Geisinger launched a, a, a remarkable innovation, offering patients their money back if they were not um, satisfied with the kindness and compassion that they expected to receive. Did that move not bankrupt Geisinger? Oh, just the opposite, John. I think it's been the best secret shopper program ever in healthcare. Our patients are telling us what's right and what's wrong. That's excellent news. And again, I want to thank, welcome the team arguing against this motion. The U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. We go in three rounds. Let's move on to round one. Those are opening statements from each debater in turn. They will be six minutes each. Up speaking first in support of the motion, the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. Here is Shannon Brownlee, Senior Vice President of the Lown Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Shannon Brownlee. I think this is my one opportunity to feel like a model is walking down that <laughs> runway. So you're gonna vote on a single premise. But in fact, there are two ideas in that premise. And one of them is you have to ask yourself the question, just how broken is the system anyway? And my partner, Robbie Pearl, and I agree that it is incredibly broken. If it were a patient, if the healthcare system were a patient, we would have put it in the ICU long ago. But the second thing you must decide is whether or not the reforms that are in place can revive that patient. And we agree again, Robbie and I, it can't. They can't. It is in worse shape than our opponents are going to argue. And we think the reforms are less than adequate. So my job is to paint a picture of the system that is. And Robbie will lay out a great system that could be and what it will take to get there. Now I warn you, the picture I'm gonna paint isn't very pretty. And some of you, especially those of you who work in organized salaried group practices like Mayo, like Kaiser, like Geisinger, may think I'm exaggerating. But you are islands of excellence in a sea of mediocrity. And out there, it's a bit of a war zone. We have fragmented care. We have burned out physicians and nurses. We have three to one, a quarter of a million patients die every year of errors, nosocomial infection, and adverse drug events. We've had a record number of drug recalls in the last decade, in part because we have an FDA that is a captive agency. It's bought and paid for by the industry that it's supposed to be regulating. We have, and don't get me started on medical devices. Um, we have tragic care for the elderly. We've almost killed primary care. And we're still paying fee-for-service even though we know that fee-for-service rewards more care, not better care. It's kind of like paying for a car based on the number of parts in the car. And we still do not have universal coverage. Meanwhile, costs are out of control. They're out of control because prices are out of control. And it's not just drug companies that are the problem, it's that everybody is charging what the market will bear. Costs are also out of control because of how much we waste on fraud, on administration, on inefficiency, and on my special interest, over-treatment. We spend about $300 billion a year on services that patients don't need. And when you add it all up, the waste is about a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars. So costs are also out of control because we have massively over-invested in the hospital sector and under-invested in primary care and community-based care. It's because, and hospitals are now consolidating as fast as that they can in order to capture market share and drive up prices even higher. They are investing in technology and specialty care, not because that's good for the community, because it's good for their bottom line. So I'll give you an example. I live in Washington, D.C., and two hospitals have proton beam machines, and two more are building them. Now, this is a $100 million machine that has been shown to be effective, more effective than standard radiation therapy for a handful of cancers. At most, we need one proton beam machine in Washington. In fact, really, we don't need any because we've got two in Baltimore, which is 30 miles away. So hospitals are saying to heck with the evidence. If it's good for the bottom line, we're going to invest. As long as we keep paying free for service, hospitals are going to be thinking more about margin than they are about mission. 
Now, are, right, are ACOs going to right size our hospital sector? So in 2012, we had, 12, we had 32 pioneer ACOs. Today, we have eight. The other 24 dropped out because they didn't like the risk. And you can't blame them. When most of your book of business is in fee-for-service, and a small part of it is at risk, it's like having one foot in two different canoes. So every one of these problems is fixable. But they should be seen not as isolated ailments. They're kind, of, they're kind of sepsis. They're systemic failures requiring systemic solutions. But the majority of actors out there, what Robbie calls the legacy players, the hospitals, the drug companies, the, the AAMC, the device makers, the insurers, they aren't going to like systemic solutions very much. And they're resisting a lot of these solutions, and they won't fix the problems that exist until they have to. So hospitals, uh, bundled payments are not going to change hospital costs appreciably. They're going to they're be an incentive to deliver more bundles. And then there's Medicare for all. Now, I hate saying this as a card-carrying Bernie supporter and a supporter of single payer, but if we do Medicare for all that just pays fee-for-service or worse, pays fee-for-service and has Medicare fees go up to what private pay, we're in trouble. Now, our opponents are going to give you examples of incredible care, fantastic primary care, fantastic, um, fantastic medical records, many, many wonderful innovations. But the problem is these are million-dollar solutions to a trillion-dollar problem, and they are not going to scale up. They're one-offs. So given this, I think that you have to vote in favor of the premise. The American healthcare system is terminally broken. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon Brownlee. And that's the motion, the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. Our next debater will be speaking against the motion. He is Zeke Emanuel, Vice Provost for Global Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania and author of Prescription for the Future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Zeke Emanuel. Everyone agrees that the U.S. healthcare system is broken. There's $800 billion, a trillion dollars of waste, at least $200 billion of unnecessary care and $130 billion of inefficiently delivered care. The quality of the American healthcare system is not great, almost no matter how you measure it, whether it's infant mortality, survival after acute myocardial infarctions, even cancer treatments that we pound our chest on as being the best in the world. Childhood leukemia, we're exceeded by Germany by four percentage points. Breast cancer, France does better than us. We are generally underperforming. No doubt about it. But the key word in the proposition is terminally broken. Are we terminally broken? Are we beyond fixing? Now let me just say, uh, Dr. Pearl there is a reconstructive surgeon. My partner, David Feinberg, is a child psychiatrist. I'm the only one who's an expert in terminal. I'm an oncologist. <laughs> and I will tell you, we are not terminally ill. Sick, but not terminally ill. If you go around the country, there are multiple points of light, much more than Shannon says, and not only reserved for places like Mayo Clinic, Geisinger, and Kaiser. There are many, many places. You go to Caremore, which is a Medicare Advantage plan in Southern California, and has now branched out into Medicaid and other programs around the country in places like Tennessee and Iowa. They care for chronically ill elders, much sicker than the average Medicare patient, and they do phenomenally well. They have 45% fewer hospital admissions than Medicare, regular Medicare. Their readmission rate is, if you control for risk, 10% compared to Medicare's average at 17%. And in their dialysis patient, they have 85% fewer bed days. Just one example. If you go to a small group in Hawaii, they've addressed behavioral health problems by co-locating a lot of psychologists in their office. This is a 15-person primary care group with a couple of surgeons, a couple ob gyne doctors. For four days a week, they co-located psychologists in their practice, and they treat depression, anxiety, smoking cessation problems, insomnia, and even patients who are non-compliant with medical disorders and have substantially improved their performance. 
Palliative care, another area where we have underperformed for many years. I've been studying it for 35 years. We now have interesting groups, a company, for-profit company based in Nashville, Tennessee, Aspire, that begins palliative care not in the last month or the last two weeks of life, but 12 months before they identify patients, send out a nurse to the home, and they've seen 25% savings and keeping patients in their homes uh, over that period of time. Hogue Orthopedic Institute, again in Southern California, they have done performance measurement and transparency correct. They have uh, looked at all their data. They've done time motion studies and got out every bit of inefficiency in their system. They flip ORs in 22 minutes. They have dropped their surgical site infection uh, almost to the zero level. They publish all their results on outcomes on the web, including patient reported outcomes of pain relief and getting back to activity. And they offer people, not just in Medicare, but everywhere, a fixed payment for their service, and they publish it right on the web, and you can get it for that price. These are but a handful of thousands of examples around the country. So how do we scale them? Well, let's be honest. The key is behavior change. Behavior change of doctors and behavior change of patients. How are we going to get doctors and hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, home health care agencies, and all the rest to change? We know we have to change the financial and non-financial incentives. There is no disagreement between our side and the affirmative side that we need to change off the fee-for-service system. The fee-for-service system rewards doctors for doing too much. I'm an oncologist. It rewards us for giving chemotherapy. The question is, can we move off the fee-for-service system? We already are moving off the fee-for-service system. Shannon downplayed the, affordable, uh, the accountable care organizations. Actually, today, there are 32 million Americans in ACOs through Medicare and commercial plans. And we know that the longer a group stays in the ACOs until the fourth year, then they begin to see real transformation. Bundled payments. We've seen tremendous change in bundled payments in creating efficiency, in bringing down the cost, in actually bringing down, uh, uh, making quality the same. We don't sacrifice at all. We have Medicare bundles, we have private insurance bundles, and we have states like Arkansas and Tennessee introducing bundles uh, broadly. They are going to expand because they actually bring returns relatively quickly. And most importantly, we have MACRA, which is a bill passed uh, by a, uh, a bipartisan bill passed, and it is financially incentivizing doctors. Either they take these alternative payment methods, which moves them off fee-for-service, or they have very, very high pay for performance, up 9% or down 9% to actually improve quality, but also being responsible for the cost of care. Yes, we can transform the American system. It's not terminally ill, but we need to be careful about the timeline. We are not going to transform it overnight. It takes four years before you begin to see change, and then 10 years before change sits in. 2030 is the right time scale. This is not like flipping the switch. This is change over time of a $3.4 trillion industry. We are not terminally ill. We can save the American healthcare system. Thank you, Zeke Emanuel. And a reminder of what's going on. We are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over this motion. The U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. You have heard the first two opening statements, and now on to the third. I want to welcome to the stage uh, Robert Pearl, former CEO of the Permanente Medical Group and author of the best-selling book, Mistreated, Why We Think We're Getting Good Healthcare and Why We're Usually Wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Pearl. The American healthcare system is terminally broken. Shannon's told you the magnitude of the problems and the solutions that exist are simply inadequate. I think of them as a patient with systemic infection from bacteria, give it a couple of penicillin pills, not powerful intravenous antibiotics. The reason is simple. What's in place today was a compromise, a political compromise to get the congressional votes and to avoid the ire of the hospital systems, the health plan systems, and the drug industry. It is simply inadequate 
to be able to overcome the shortcomings, shortcomings that led to the premature death of my father. My father, Jack Pearl, was an amazing man, the son of two immigrant parents. He paid, worked his way through college and dental school. When World War II came around, he could have stayed behind American lines. He volunteered for the 101st Airborne, parachuted on D-Day. He and his unit were captured by the Germans. He led a daring escape at night. Brokaw would call him the greatest generation. Later in life, he developed a hemolytic anemia. He needed to have his spleen taken out. The operation went well. My brother and I, my brother's the chairman of anesthesia at Stanford, handpicked the doctors, the half in New York and the half in Florida who lived for each six months of the year. They were excellent physicians. They all knew that after splenectomy, you were at much higher risk, much higher risk for an infection called pneumococcus. They all knew that there was a vaccine that could have prevented the complications. But the ones in New York thought Florida gave it to him. Florida thought New York. Primary care thought specialty care. Especially, he never had it. He came out to visit my brother and me. Dinner at my house with my brother's house in Palo Alto. Next morning at 5 o'clock, my brother finds my dad on the floor, unresponsive. Four days in the ICU, three weeks in the hospital. He survives the admission, but never the complications. The diagnosis, pneumococcal septicemia. One of 200,000 people that year and every year, including this year who will die from preventable medical errors. Embedded in a story is much that is wrong, much that is wrong with American medicine today. It is still paid. 92% of physicians get paid on a fee-for-service basis. They get rewarded for splenectomy. They don't get rewarded for thinking about how they can make sure he got the vaccine that is needed. If we're going to address not just quality, but also address cost, we have to move from fee-for-service to capitation. It's difficult, but anything less will be incomplete. Zeke talked about bundled payments. The evidence says in bundled payments, costs come down on a unit basis, but doctors do more. When hospitals and doctors consolidate, what do we see happening? They don't use it to improve efficiency and effectiveness of care. No, they use it to raise the price by controlling the marketplace. And the alphabet soup of current Medicare, MACRA, and MIPS, and APMs, doctors don't even understand this. Yeah, they'll meet the bundle, the requirements to get paid, but they will never change the way they provide care under the current rules. His doctors didn't have the information they needed. Every American needs to have the totality of the medical information available to every physician in hospital at every point of contact. It can be done, it's called ATMs, but it won't get done. Why is that? Because the people who manufacture and sell the electronic health records are not going to open up their, what's called APIs, the application processing uh, software that's necessary for third-party developers to come in because they know it will break the stranglehold they have on those who have purchased the systems already. And we need to make sure we address the issue of drug prices. Drug costs are rising three times more rapidly than medical inflation, five times more rapidly than overall inflation. It used to be a drug company spent all their money on R&D. That's not happening anymore. A lot of them are simply acquiring competitors, creating monopolistic control of that marketplace. And as a consequence of doing that, they're able to simply raise price. Just look at all the things that happened with EpiPen and primary care. My father's primary care physician was overwhelmed as physicians are across the nation today in primary care. 20, 25, 30 patients being seen every single day. We talk about primary care, but we still train more specialists than primary care physicians. The 15 minute visit has got to become a thing of the past. The changes that are happening, the Medicare changes, are making the life of primary care worse. I asked a friend the other day, I said, how come there are 80 separate measures to evaluate primary care performance? He said, because that's all of the columns that exist on an Excel spreadsheet. It would be twice as many if they could have as many in place. The government needs to intervene in the drug world they need to increase competition. 
the government needs to intervene and use Medicare to buy drugs on behalf of patients. Every other nation in the world does it. Our Congress has prohibited our government from accomplishing it. What we know today is that the American healthcare system is terminally broken. All the small fixes you heard about from Zeke will make a small degree the one-offs, people in one area will do it, but not in another area. We've got to change all of American medicine, how it's organized, how it's reimbursed, how it is led, how it's technologically supported. It is terminally ill. It does not have to be. I urge you to vote yes on the motion so that the work can begin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert Pearl. Again, the motion is the U.S. health care system is terminally broken. And here's our final debater in making an opening statement against the motion, David Feinberg, the president and CEO of Geisinger. Please welcome David Feinberg. Thanks, John. So this, this I, I'm not a professional debater, so this may be suicide, but I'm going to start by disagreeing with Zeke, okay? <laughs> so Zeke is an expert on terminal illness, but hey, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm the expert on behavioral change. So let's talk about behavioral change. We could fix every problem we have in healthcare immediately, 50% of the cost. If we ate right, we didn't use illegal drugs, we drank alcohol in moderation, we wore our seat belts, we didn't shoot one another, and we prevented adverse childhood, uh, adverse childhood uh, situations that we know we could prevent. Overnight, we fix the healthcare debate. And all, all we hear about ACOs and MIPS and MACRA, that's mumbo jumbo. And when, when I'm sure that our opponents will tell you that the United States spends more on healthcare than most industrialized countries, and our outcomes aren't as good. But that graph is actually misleading because the United States spends the least amount on social services compared to those other countries. And when you combine social service spend and medical spend, we're kind of just in the middle. So we have an option. We can either start spending as a country on social services, or it's up to the healthcare system to fill that gap. So can it be done? Well, I, I would ask all of you in this audience, I mean, if you look at the graphs that they will talk about, if you have crushing chest pain right now, and that graph shows that it's better for you to get care in Uruguay, are you not gonna go across the street to the Mayo Clinic? So acute care in America is actually excellent. We've designed our system to do that. And I take really offense by what Robert says because Robert represented an organization that has showed our country how to do this the right way. Kaiser Permanente, which starts in Oakland, California, Geisinger Health System, which starts in Danville, Pennsylvania, are examples that healthcare reform does not start in Washington, D.C. It starts in communities that are committed to the people that are living there, that understand the problems, and engage in creative and innovative solutions to make things better, so that every patient gets care that's compassionate, safe, <laughs> dignified, and low cost. So we've done some things at Geisinger. We've sequenced 100,000 people's entire DNA for free. We look at their DNA, and about 4% of those people have medically actionable conditions that we can intervene with before the bad thing happens. And on those cases, there's probably about four first-degree and second-degree relatives that are also affected. So that's genetic code. It's healthcare is not just about getting to the doctor and getting to the hospital. It's understanding your genetic code and also your zip code. And when we looked at zip codes where we provide care, we have towns like Shamokin, Pennsylvania, where 80% of the kids are on subsidized lunch. The rates of diabetes are one in four to one in five. Food insecure people with great health care through Geisinger still have measures of blood sugar that are out of control. Guess what happens? when we bring those people in and we say to them, here is food, fresh fruits, vegetables, lean meats, um, legumes. And if you're living in a motel, we've got spatulas for you and we have microwaves and hot plates. We're gonna teach you about your diabetes and we're gonna give you and your food 
you and your family this food to eat. Every single patient has had a decrease in their hemoglobin A1C, in their blood pressure, in their weight. If this was a pill, it would be a multi-billion dollar pill. We can use food as medicine. And it's it, 100%. If a pill de decreases your hemoglobin A1C by one point, it gets approved. We've seen patients have decreases in hemoglobin A1C of four or five points to the normal range. I think together, communities can say, we're gonna eliminate type two diabetes. And Kaiser has been a star at this. They've been a star at making sure that every patient that comes in, when you go to the dermatologist at Kaiser and you check in, they say to you, Mr. Feinberg, we notice you haven't had your colonoscopy. Can we get that scheduled for you? They're closing care gaps on every single patient. So these primary preventions are saving millions of lives, and they've published that. Now, the question that Shannon says, are these just pilots, and can they scale? I got news for you. People call us, people call Kaiser every day. About 10 or 12 years ago, we did the first heart surgery with a warranty. The New York Times said if you had a, the New York Times called it a warranty, if you had an infection or got readmitted, we didn't charge you extra money. Hey, guess what? Bundles, and we can debate whether they're good or bad, have now spread across the country. So I believe healthcare reform begins with the docs, the nurses, the patients, the moms, the brothers and sisters, the communities coming together, taking care of one another, scaling these great ideas, and making sure that every patient gets the exact kind of care that you'd want for everyone in your family. Thank you very much. Thank you, David Feinberg. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where the motion is the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. In round two, the debaters direct questions to one another and take questions from me. We have two teams arguing for and against the motion. The U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. We've heard from Shannon Branley and Robert Pearl who are arguing for the motion. They're saying that, yes, there are reforms in place, but they cannot make the system work, that costs are out of control, too much emphasis still on paying fee for service. They don't think that the islands of excellence, which both sides concede are out there, can stand up to the overwhelming sea of mediocrity. They don't think that these things are ultimately scalable. They think also that government does need to get involved in some of this. Um, but basically, their position is uh, that metaphorically, the system is so sick right now that it will not yield to a couple of penicillin pills. The team arguing against the motion, Zeke Emanuel and David Feinberg, they concede also that, in fact, the system is broken, but they say it's not terminally broken. They are pointing to numerous points of light. Uh, they've talked about palliative care, various technological advances. They're saying we are sick but we are not terminally sick. They say there are thousands of examples of things that are working and that these can be scaled given behavioral change on the parts of stake stakeholders in the system, and they think that those behavioral changes can be brought about. Basically, they are saying that the solutions for the future, which probably both sides agree upon in the end game, they're saying that those solutions for the future are already baked into the present, a rather radical, uh, a forecast from Zeke Emanuel that he thinks we're going to be in very decent shape in the year 2030. I want to take the argument to the side arguing for the motion and start with you, Shannon Brownlee. Um, your opponents taking issue with your argument that the, the points of light, the islands of excellence cannot be scaled, and they're saying, sure they can. Argue that point with them. Well, you know, I I've been around a long time and reporting on healthcare for a long time when I was a reporter, back when I was a reporter. And um, we've seen periods of ferment in healthcare before. And each time there are these incredible points of light, and I don't argue them at all. They are fantastic, and there are a lot of them. But somehow, the existing legacy players somehow mean, managed to beat it back. Why is this time different? So I, I think uh, let's look at uh, the mid-90s. We had a big push to control health care costs uh, after the failure of the Clinton health care reform, and it was managed care, and it basically was 1-800-JUST-SAY-NO. Um, and the public did revolt against that and did 
want more choice and not drive-through deliveries. And the consequence was we got rid of any management and costs did go up. Now we have a different problem. Now the problem the public is upset about is affordability. It is the inefficiency and thus unnecessary care of the system. And the public, uh, the various uh, people who can control the system are responding. We do have very powerful, I know that they dismiss them, but they agree that bundle payments are making the system more efficient and we have to get the per unit cost down. Uh, there are many ways to do that, shared decision making. Zeke, how do, how do you answer her question, why is this time different? Uh, I'm, I'm explaining it. You have the public that is pushing, you have employers that are pushing, and you have changes in policy throughout okay. the system. So you're saying not just Not just in Medicare, Medicaid, but also in the private sector through employers and through insurers. And that push all together okay. is going to drive the system. A and, so, and we have something else that we didn't have back then. We have data. We now have an electronic health record, as clunky it is, is and tough it is, is. We now have data to help make these decisions that we didn't have the, so, in the 90s. So you're saying there is now an alignment of forces that has never been seen before working in favor of the, your side of the argument. I want to take that to Robert Pearl. That's why they're saying this time it's different. Yeah. So a couple of things. First, in terms of bundle payments, what does the data show? Bundle payments work very nicely to lower unit price. What have we seen? We've seen two things. Physicians do more total joints now, yep. and on spine surgery, they do more complex. The cost increase from the complexity that has been put in place in response is more than the dollars that have been saved in an article published this month, Zeke, published this month on the outcomes. But I want to address something that David said, which is he's absolutely right. We have places like Geisinger and Kaiser and Mayo that do things very well. They've been at it for 100 years, Mayo, over 100 years, 70 years. The question is, how do you take a broken fee-for-service system, a 19th century cottage industry with doctors scattered across the community, small hospitals in every town, and now put that together into a Geisinger or a Kaiser? We believe that that's not going to happen without major force. Let, let me cite, let me cite Kaiser Mid-Atlantic, just to the former CEO of Kaiser uh, North uh, Northern California. He knows this well. Kaiser went into Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland, and like many times before, it wasn't going well. And it almost went bankrupt in 2007 and 2008. And then it got a very important leader, instituted the Kaiser practices correctly, and now it's the most popular health system in Washington, D.C. It's keeping costs down, quality up, and its enrollment has gone, from, uh, uh, gone up by 50% from about 400,000 a few years ago to 600,000. It's a five-star Medicare plan. His case himself shows that okay. you can transform the Zeke, system so far Zeke. away from home. So Zeke, I was the CEO who went to the Atlantic. I'm the one who led that entire process. You can show it can be done. I led it in an environment that was integrated, that was prepaid, that had technology on all of the patients, and, ha and brought in with me a huge amount of leaders. It can be done. The problem is it can't be done across the so space. Hey, John, 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 can I say let, something? No, wait. I want how, to add tell something. me how, <laughs> you how can, is Kaiser, hang on a second. <laughs> how is Kaiser or Geisinger, Geisinger better, how is Geisinger going to make make inroads in Pittsburgh? You know what? Uh, let, let me read from <laughs> no, Robert's book. You're not going to answer the okay, let me Wait, read Actually, <laughs> we, we want to hear questions answered. You yeah. can get to that moment. Yeah. She asked a good question. How is and then it you going to that make moment. an inroad in Pittsburgh? Uh, actually, uh, actually, Robert is, 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 is an inspiration for me, and he's given the answer to that question. Okay. Here's how, how, what he says from his book. <laughs> okay, this, actually, Robert should bring his chair over here. Um, <laughs> Trans Look at this. Is this you, Robert? So it says, transforming the conditions of American medicine will be difficult but possible. And mistreated outlines the steps necessary to transform American medical practice. The first step, so here's the answer, Shannon, from your partner, will be awakening, becoming aware of patients, how we're mistreated. That's the first step. From there, we'll need youthful optimism. We can't make this a terminal illness. We have to fix this. Um, we have a collective confidence that our problems can be solved. That will be followed by years of hard work. And at the end, I hope we will have freed American medicine from the outdated college industry okay. it resembles today. Shannon, Robert, Robert Pearl. Shannon Brownlee. 2017. 2017. Shannon yeah, Bradley to respond. But, but you got to read the whole book yeah. to oh. find out. <laughs> <laughs> David, there's that a difference is not going to happen in yeah. Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. There's a difference between being terminally ill and dead. We're not saying We're not it's saying dead. It's dead. <laughs> We're just saying it's terminally ill and something radically different than yeah. just moving along little steps at a time. 
things will get far worse. You know, my before. wife is an ICU doctor, and when they're terminally ill, we got to go slow. <laughs> we got to talk to the family. We got to listen. If we do something radical in the ICU, I, I think we would all agree that's a mistake. Before yeah, 2010, that's before Shannon. Wait, wait, wait. Far. Yeah, hope, Shannon. This metaphor has gone too far. It's, it's time to call okay. a moratorium on the patient, the healthcare system as a patient in the ICU. But before 2010, we were all fee for service except for a few holdouts like uh, Kaiser, like Geisinger. We put into the Affordable Care Act a mechanism to have payment transformation, which was led by Medicare, but not only by Medicare. We've had states adopt payment transformation for their Medicaid programs. I mentioned Arkansas and Tennessee as but two examples. Ohio's doing stuff, and so are other states. Oregon's doing some interesting things with its Medicare population. In addition, we have private payers that have entered this space and are using various different payment mechanisms to shift. I'm working with uh, uh, the uh, uh, Blue Shield firm in Hawaii, they're trying to move all the primary care doctors in the state of Hawaii to capitation. It's not easy and it takes time. Robbie. And those changes are happening throughout the country. It is not just a few okay. points of light. It Robert, is tens of thousands. Robert Pearl, ha has Zeke Emanuel effectively refuted your point that it can't be scaled? I don't think so at all. He's okay. talking about these very small places that can do something. What Kaiser's an learn, 80 billion wait, 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 wait. What I, I, let, let him finish this point and then we can come back. Physicians learn it's always easier to do more than to do things more efficiently and better. If you actually follow the thinking through, you can end up having to close hospitals, have fewer specialists, make massive investments in technology, and just think back to when they try to close naval yards. The protests that are going to happen are going to be massive. This change is going to be so radical that I think we have to understand the amount of pain that's there. And that's why we see it as being terminally broken. Not impossible, but the likelihood is people will turn around and go back before most of them progress. And by the way, Hawaii is a very, very interesting place because there's really only two insurers. Well, there's Medicare. But there's HMSA, which is the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, and there's Kaiser. And, well, that's actu and it's a, it, that actually makes a difference. That, Shannon, that's true of many states. Alabama, the Blue Cross plan has 80% of the market. Uh, Tennessee, the Blue Cross plan has 80% of the market. The fact is, you have big insurers across the country. You have Cigna and many others that are trying uh, to move to capitation, move to steering patients to efficient providers. You have the Massachusetts Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan, which introduced the AQC, the alternative quality contracts. Which, which primary which, care doctors love. Uh, wait a second, which brought down costs and improved the quality, but it took four years of working hard at it. And it is, has to be sustained. And if we start out now, and we are doing this, and you're lifting up the pot and saying after one year, is it boiling yet? That is too early. Change takes time. It takes four years before you get the maximum change and then 10 years. It is going to be resisted. There's no doubt. But we have data, as David says, driving the system. We have changes in financial, uh, financial incentives driving the system. And we also do have the closing of hospitals okay. and the shifting of incentives. Zeke, Zeke I have to break in uh, with respect because you're very okay. compelling. Just okay. in terms of time, I need to let these guys talk. So I'm going to break in every now and then just so your opponent that's can fine. talk. That's uh, fine. But this doesn't mean we don't want to hear what you have to say. But to the other side, can you respond? I, I want you to take on. I don't know. Which point do we respond well, to? Well, I'm so interested in the argument the that you were making. Zeke just mentioned resistance. Yes. And uh, you both talked in your opening statement about legacy players. The fact that 92% of, uh, of uh, your statistic was 92%, Robert. Uh, uh, fee for service. Uh, still, uh, still, still fee for service, service and, and they like it. They like it. They and, like it a lot. Yeah, 78% say they don't want to change. And, and what's the significance of their just saying they don't want to change? Because I think your opponents are sort of saying too bad. Well, you can say too bad, but at some particular point, as I say, in a fee-for-service world, what they're going to do is to start to increase the volume. The problem right now in you know, what uh, David and Zeke are talking about is the same thing we're talking about. 
I think what we're arguing about is the likelihood of it happening. Right, we are. And, and, and we're basically saying it's not likely to happen because the hospital will find a way to get paid fee-for-service. We say they're moving towards pay-for-value, capitation. We're talking about small pieces. We're not talking about taking entire populations like Geisinger has or Kaiser has or Mayo has that's able to scale that. We're talking about doctors in small offices trying to manage all of that. You know, even this very radical Medicare payment under macro, nine plus, mi nine minus. First of all, that's only about quality. It's not gonna affect the cost very much. And we're still talking about 10%. The overall practice, the idea of having a single electronic record, you know how difficult that's gonna be to get every okay. doctor in the community? So we're okay. saying the scale is so huge, okay. So you've made a, you, same, same thing. You've made a bunch of points. Well, let me let your so so. Oh, I'd like back. to make a couple. Okay, I'll, I'll let Chad and, and then I want David. Sure, to fair enough. The, number one, Zeke, I'm not saying that you look after a year and you say, "Up, oh, not working. It's terminal." That's not true. That's not what we're saying. It's that it is a massive, massive problem. Number two, it does take time, and number three. We have one state that's globally budgeted all of its hospitals, and it's going along pretty well. It's not like they have suddenly become all, everybody's at risk instantly. They're moving slowly. It's the state of Maryland. But they're getting there. But it took, it took a, a big shift in somebody saying from the top, we're not going to pay you fee for service anymore. We're not going to pay the same way. So, so, and, and Robert, you've got to agree with me on this. Doctors that are coming out of training now are not going into private practice. They're joining Kaiser and Geisinger. They're joining, they, they when we, when I used to hire doctors 20 years ago, they want to know how much money they made, when they became partner and all that kind of stuff. Now they want to know, can they still go to Haiti? Can they be, is it team based? And you know, what's, what's the live, white, live work balance? It's going away fee for service. Kaisers of the world are where people, or large medical groups, are where people are going. So to say that this fee-for-service thing is going to kill us, got us but, where we But his we number of 92% means what? Let me give an example. Well, let, let me, I just want to answer that question since it's hanging out there. He, he talks about 92% of, of doctors are still working fee-for-service. You're saying it's going away. It, it has to go away. No one is going into fee-for-service. It, it just doesn't make sense. So, so, so it's going to take time. There's a lot of doctors who are 40 years old or 50 years old and are going to stay in fee-for-service. But the new ones that are coming out, 90% another are going thing, into fee-for-service. Another point of dispute can I, I see is... Can I give an example that, of how we have... So, Zeke, hang created. on one second. I, I want to I pick up a point to, to keep it in play that Shannon made while it's still out there that she said that change is going to have to come from the top. And you made an argument in your opening, David, that the change actually has to come from the bottom. That's right. So w respond to her point on that then. You know, when I was at UCLA, we diagnosed the first case of AIDS. We did more organ transplants than any hospital in the United States. We in invented Herceptin. Those things don't come from Washington, D.C. Right? They come, those innovations happen in our academic medical centers. They happen in places that try to figure things out differently. And this healthcare reform thing, is going to happen the same way. And it's because communities, people like our audience are going to say, you know why we have to do it this time? Because we can't afford not to do it. Because if we don't do it, we don't have money for roads. We don't have money for schools. It's a different day. I think we have a moral imperative to get it right. And I think it's going to get pulled by our communities. So can I just say something? It, sure. Look, it's synergistic. It's partially from below with innovative doctors and hospitals. It's partially from above that changes the financial incentives. Let me give you a very good example of where we've had massive change in the system. It's far from perfect. But before the uh, um, Recovery Act in 2009, there were 9% of hospitals had electronic health records. No doctors had electronic health records. We put in incentives to say you had to use health, electronic health records. I'm not saying it's nirvana. I'm not saying it was rightly done. I oppose many of our regulations and thought they should be different. But today, seven years later, every hospital has an electronic health record. All doctors are getting on board with it. And we are going to see in the next generation those APIs are opening up. The APIs did Epic okay. open this week. So, Wait, I, I and need the to break second in. thing I would yeah. say, just let me no, say. No, no, let me, let me st stop at, at that one and let Robert So two things. And I'll come First, back to you. you're absolutely right. Hospitals have done it. Fewer than 20% of physician offices can communicate with that machine, even though it's next door. 
And that is going to be the big leap. It's not getting a hospital to be able to do it to meet regulatory. But I want to talk about one the of the things. The whole point is so it's not impossible to do that change. And communication between the hospitals is, again, something that is going to be required of them. And that is going to make a big so difference. Between, between San Jose and San Francisco, Silicon Valley, where I live, there's 10 hospitals doing heart surgery. Three of them do fewer than 300 cases a year. That means there's 65 days a year they're not doing anything. Guess what they do? They're raising their prices to be able to pay for the inefficiencies that sit in place. I've seen no change. I've not heard a single CEO talking about closing their thing or putting the systems together. You're going to have to take them and make sure it happens, and that's going to require far more. Robert, where is the most right complicated? Now. Who does the biggest volume of complicated surgeries in, in Southern California? Probably in Kaiser Permanente or in... Uh, Kaiser Permanente, right. not UCLA, not Cedars. I understand. So it, you, you're say, in a market, people are driving by nine or ten hospitals through traffic to go to Kaiser Permanente. Because they have no choice right now, David, because they bought the insurance that forces them to go there. It, they have the great outcomes. What do you mean no choice? It's make fantastic. make it happen if you're going to make it happen. And why you make it painless? Why do you make small baby steps? So, why do you have demonstration? It sounds great. And nothing's going to change around the cost or around the hundreds of thousands of lives no, that we're losing look, every year. Here's another good example of where uh, you see change and you see change uh, in exactly the kinds of areas that Robbie is mentioning. CalPERS, the California uh, Public Employee Retirement Plan, has gone to reference pricing for a lot of surgical services. They say, we're going to give you X amount of money. You can go to the most expensive person doing that procedure, uh, you have to pay the difference between the $24,000 we are giving you and the $45,000 they are charging. What happens when you put reference pricing in? Those people charging $45,000 reduce right. their price because people aren't going to pay that delta. One that, operation, Zeke, one operation they do for total joints. No, right they are doing it for, car, for cataracts and they are going to spread it. These are cases that we are spreading around the country. I you, keep hear, I, saying, I, you keep saying, oh, everything's an exception. Everything can't be an exception. These are, are good examples that are okay. going to be generalized, and that's why you are optimistic right. in your I wanna, you I wanna, I wanna, Excuse me. I wanna, <laughs> I, excuse me. I want to hear more from Shannon. I, you know, I actually I find myself agreeing with a great deal of what our opponents say. Um, I think you want to come over to our side, should too? Should we do the voting no, now? Not at the moment. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> The, the piece that's really important that you just said, Zeke, which is that the, the innovation is bubble, has to bubble up from underneath. But there are some things that have to be imposed from above, and the shift in payment has to be imposed. We agree. So who's going to do the imposing? Um, Medicare hasn't done it yet. I'm hoping at some point it's going to move to some kind of global budgeting for hospitals and that it's going to start giving, it's going to start putting physicians at risk. Um, but are the private plans really going to move this direction? Are they going to do it? And are they going to do Shannon, it in a way? I, I've had an opportunity to work in, a, in a, an academic medical center and now in an integrated delivery health system. It, it's a culture and an understanding that takes years to develop. And to do it immediately, to turn the switch, would be a disaster. I know. So you've got to start it with upside risk only, and then upside and downside risk, and then greater. I mean, it, it's an iterative process to get us there. And if we push it, I think we're really, it's a recipe for disaster. So, well, so maybe look, we should wait, wait, look wait, wait, and see what, Maybe we should see and look, look and see what happens in the state of Maryland. So Everybody stop know, for one second. I want, have, one second. Thanks. I want to remind you that we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two debating this motion. The U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. In a moment, I want to start going to audience questions. There's a microphone up here. Just line up. Think in terms of a question that will keep us moving on this topic. Make sure it's short and tight in the question. I, I don't mind if you state a little bit of a premise before your question, but I really want you to land a question. Who wanted to speak on this? So side? we side? have examples across the board. We have private payers, uh, insurance companies uh, driving some of this, whether it's the Blue Cross and Blue Shield plan in Hawaii, it's Cigna, it's Oscar in New York, which is working towards this in its new markets in LA and Texas. We have public plans working towards financial payment change to drive this transformation in care to lower costs and higher quality. We have the various Medicare plans, plus we have now a third of Medicare patients are on Medicare Advantage, all of whom who have a financial incentive uh, because they are capitated. And then we have Medicaid plans which are also driving towards this. This is, we're not at the final tipping point, but we are driving to that tipping point and doctors are responding. 
Let me give you one example. When the oncology bundle was announced by Medicare, it was a voluntary bundle to give doctors a set price for giving chemotherapy to patients. And they got more money to talk to patients and less money for their chemotherapy. 15% of American oncologists voluntarily signed up for this because they want to shift how they're practicing right out of the box. So we have a lot of doctor interest. We have payment change from the various payers. Uh, this is the mix for uh, self-reinforcing uh, move towards payment change that's going to lead us to adopting these transformational practices, which, by the way, everyone on this panel, their side and our side, agree are out there. We know how to do this. This is not reinventing the wheel or getting to the moon. Okay. This so, is okay. putting in place Robert, and spreading what we know. Robert Pearl to respond. So two things. First, Zeke, the oncology change was going to be mandatory, and Congress backed away because of the resistance coming out of the National Society. But I want to say the following. This is like the Game of Thrones. This is like the White Walkers. I don't watch TV. Okay. It's not a good analogy. No. I'll tell you about the White Walkers. How do you that, know it's not a good analogy? That, that I don't know nothing about the Game of Thrones. Well, maybe it's a good analogy. In the I first season, everyone talks, well, maybe it exists. It's happening. We're going to fight it. It's going to be there. And then finally, by season seven, Daenerys' dragon comes and blows down the wall of ice and snow. <laughs> uh, that's what we're talking about right now. Is this going to happen because people are going to do these very small things? You don't think they're small, except when you actually look at the examples you're giving, they're changing a few things here and there. The totality of American health care is not changing significantly enough. And right now, the legislation, I'm going to mention in my closing comments, the drug industry spent $150 billion, sorry, $150 million in the first six months of this year on lobbying and on getting contributions to people's campaign funds. Do you think they're going to let a significant change happen without a major revolution in this country? The revolution has got to come. It's not going to happen on its own. Question, sir. And if you, could, if you wouldn't mind telling us... By the name, way, we don't or, disagree uh, about or, the revolution has to be propelled by people leading it. We just think there will be a revolution. I think we're <laughs> in the revolution. Sir. Dr. Feinberg, I'd like to bring you back to your opening statement. Uh, as an example, I got off of a train in the Netherlands, and there were bike racks. Yes. Not for five bikes, not for ten bikes, but for 3,000 bikes. We've pulled physical education out of our elementary schools. We've cut back on sports in our high schools. We've even pulled a uh, marching band. And we're, we're taking that away from our society. So I want to come back to your original comments and ha have you comment further on what society can do. Is it our healthcare system that's broken? Or are there other contributing factors that cause the United States to be lower in the overall ratings? It's, it's exactly what your question brings up. In, in, and I'm not an expert, but I think Amsterdam 10 years ago had no bikes. And the city and the people decided to make it a bike city. And there's so many people biking that it's actually safe to bike there because every driver of a car also is a biker. And so they watch out for each other and there's three stoplights. That's communities saying, let's get healthy. And if we do that, we don't have to worry about opening more cath labs, and we don't have to worry about getting da Vinci's if we can get people to ride bikes. So, so, can, I, can I just say one other thing? The reason we're cutting back in schools is health care costs. That's, Let's not forget it. States have fixed budgets. It's very hard for any governor to raise taxes. And when Medicare goes up and the health care costs for their state employees go up, they have to cut something. And where they're cutting is education. Collegiate education and tuition in support of the state university and primary and secondary education. That's why we're seeing those cuts that you mentioned. Opposing and if we want better services there, we have to get health care costs under control. It's an imperative for liberals and conservatives. Opposing team has the right to address that question, or yes. I can move on to the next question. Would you like to address no, that? No, I'd like to address that question. Go, go it is, it's absolutely imperative. Health care is effectively robbing state and local governments of the ability to pay for education, to pay for roads, to pay for social services. And, it's, and it's, the, it's the waste in the system that's so extraordinary. So we're basically paying for proton beam machines in, the Was in Washington, D.C., but we're not, improving private, that we're not improving public schools in Northeast and Southeast Washington. And the question that I think we have to answer is what's the mechanism going to be for that transfer of that money? 
So if, if venture capitalists come in and do, do a lot of, a number of the things that Zeke is talking about were, were, were funded by venture capitalists because they're smart. They see a trillion dollars of waste in that system and they want to put at least some of it in their own pockets. They're not going to be giving it back to those communities. They don't want to give it back to the states and local governments. So what's the mechanism that's going to work? Is it democracy in this country? That's not working so well either. So we have to have this alliance, I think, between the good doctors and the good nurses and the good CEOs of hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, who want to see that change, and employers, and patients, and people in communities. And in the 15-minute okay, doctor office visit, you don't have any time to do the counseling on wellness, to move people along. We're continuing to train more specialists than primary care. It's a 10-year window between changing how we think about the needs of the American healthcare system, and I don't think we're ever gonna change it. All of our doctors, okay. let's uh, go to see, the next question. All of our doctors that see patients over 65 spend 40 minutes minimum with their patients. Next so so it's, it's, we can do it. Next question, please. And so, could you tell us your name? My name is Ben Tingey. Thank you. Uh, and variation on a theme, it's a similar question to the, to the previous if, one. Yeah, and I just wanna say if it's too similar, I might move on, but let's hear what sure we thing. have. Okay. If improving the social determinants of health is so critical to fixing our broken system, is our social services infrastructure up to the task? And if not, what would need to change? Let's take that question. Shannon Brownlee, do you want to answer first? Is this, is the, I, I have no idea. I can't answer that question, I'm sorry. Okay, so, I that's mean, a what, very honest response. What are the social determinants we need to See, do? You're, you're not shy about taking that question. I, I'm you're gonna go shy. for it. I'm okay. not shy about, <laughs> you know, we, we have a pretty good idea about the kinds of things we need to do. We need to raise income so people aren't financially insecure. We need to give nutritious food to people. And we need early childhood interventions so kids are actually, uh, we know that that produces a better performance in school, reduces criminal activity later on, and gets people better jobs. That is actually a pretty good formula. Can we do it? Yes. Again, those are things we know how to do if our uh, local government and our federal government made it mandatory. One of the things I've strongly advocated is that on Medicaid, we should actually make nurse family partnership part of a requirement of Medicaid yes. because we know 40 to 50% of kids are now born on Medicaid and those families are stressed and their parents need education about how to uh, work with their children. Okay. That'll be phenomenal, Robert, would have finan phenomenal financial returns. Seven to Robert, one, Robert, 10 to Robert one. jump in. Yeah. I think where we disagree is what I see happening is we're going to see more erosion because as people in a fee-for-service world try to bring down prices by trying to limit the unit cost, what you're going to see is higher utilization so that the total system won't solve itself and every system of coverage will deteriorate. And what you're going to start to see is people, particularly at the lower ends of the economic scale, having less and less access to care. You're going to watch the health deteriorate. It won't happen over the one or two or three years. Same thing. It takes five to ten years. But we're going to see an ever-increasing society. Today, one in three people have diabetes or pre-diabetes. And I'm not seeing us change that. As a nation, Geisinger might, Kaiser might, the exceptions might, the 30 million people covered by these kinds of plans that Shannon and I are talking about. But the rest of the nation has not made the progress. That's 90% of the country. You don't think it all goes to manage Medicaid? And in managed Medicaid, you have to do those things. You think if they do block grants to states, states are going to say, we're going to keep this crazy fee-for-service system? If for sure, Robert. It's going to a managed system where you're going to have to address those social determinants of health because that's, otherwise you're going to just drown. I agree. That's what would happen. What I think is really going to happen is no. They're just going to basically ration care. Okay, I want to go to another question. I want to take note of the fact that... Um there are four men and one woman on the stage, and in the next line, there are four men and one woman, but she's in the back, so I don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to move you forward. <laughs> if you're not embarrassed, by, if I'm not embarrassing you by that. Okay. There's other women. Thanks. There's at least one. <laughs> Two other. Two other women. <laughs> oh, I didn't see them. Um, so, so I have heard a lot about the social determinants of health, which I agree is very important. What I'm curious about is for these private integrated health systems that, that are clearly making a profit, what are you doing to give money back to the community and to support the 28 million uninsured Americans? We're giving food. We're okay. giving housing. We're giving health literacy. I, we're, we're, we're the, give, reason, we're, the reason, I'm, I'm, stepping, the reason I'm stepping in is I don't think you guys are going to disagree about 
the, 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 that problem, and, and our disagreement is really about is the system broken? And but I'm so going to disagree with one thing. I don't think that it's. I don't think that having the hospital do that is the right way we ought to be doing that. So, so I mean, that's. But how does that? That is a band-aid on a. Shannon, social how does that? Problem. How does your answer play to the thing that we're arguing here? It, it's simply that that when healthcare is is effectively robbing our state and local and federal governments of the money to be able to do to provide these kinds of services, to provide education, to provide housing, et cetera, et cetera then um, we have to find a way to extract the money out of the system. We can't just have, keep the money in the healthcare system and then have it do its little bit for you know, giving to community services and giving to a little bit to housing. Hippocrates said food is medicine. Kaiser spends 3% of its, of its entire revenue on giving back to communities and social determinants and building walkways and, and affordable housing and making sure that there's farmers markets. Kaiser could have done because, a lot Because more. legally it is required to by the federal government or the tax rules, and that's what we're saying. We need major intervention to drive the system in the right direction, make it 4% or 5% and make it affect everyone in healthcare, and now you'll have the money so that we need. Do you disagree that major service. intervention is needed? The term they're using, major intervention. Ma major intervention is happening. We, we, we're talking about we, major intervention. But it's not. Agree. Kaiser let, made let a me, billion can, can dollars I, in profit last year. Can, can I put can 3% I, into, into food? 3% of revenue. That's, that's $3 billion. Okay, but, but wait, they wait a second. Can, 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 wait, hold it. I, hold it. Hold it. it I, I, we a, can't all talk at once. To follow we, smart money. Zeke, hang on a second. We can't all talk at once, so let me sort it out. You'll go first, and then we'll move back to the side. Go ahead, Zeke. Well, one of the things in business is says, follow the smart money. Follow where investment is happening. And the smart money in venture capital has shown that over the last, uh, since passage of the Affordable Care Act, investments in improving the American health care system, not producing more drugs or devices, but in actually improving the uh, quality of the system and lowering costs, has gone up by 32%. A lot of venture capitalists, as Shannon says, see opportunity in the healthcare system to make it more efficient and get rid of unnecessary care. Yes, they want their cut. But one of the factors is if you make it happen, lots of people are going to save by reducing the cost and improving the quality. Not just patients, but also the federal government, private payers, and others, because the way we care for patients throughout the system will change. Robbie. This is, takes time. And we're at the early stages. Okay, I'm going to call time. I'm going to call time to bring in Robert Pearl. So you're absolutely right. 30 percent of almost nothing is not a whole lot of money. The biggest thing right now: show me a hospital that's not expanding, that's not building, that's not buying high-cost technology. These investments are being made for the most part in Silicon Valley. I live there in very expensive systems designed to make a lot of money. It's not being invested in the communities, in the wellness programs. It's not being invested there in the so, big dollars. So Robert, you got to leave Silicon Valley. So I left. Every <laughs> <laughs> and I went to central Pennsylvania. And in central Pennsylvania, we are converting hospitals and getting rid of cath labs and making a multi-specialty clinics that are focusing on primary and secondary care. Hospital are beds are going down in right. America. A lot. And let me give you an example. When did we reach the peak of hospitalization in America? 1981. We had 170 hospitalizations per 1,000 patients. We're now down to 109 hospitalizations per 1,000 American people. And the fact is, we are getting people out of the hospital. We're closing hospital beds, uh, just contrary to what Robbie said. The major I'm going I'm to move on to another question, sir, if you can step up. Thank you very much for your question. If you could tell us your name, please. John Cutterback with AMGA. For scaling up, do we need a uniform national person identifier for health care? And if we do, is that politically feasible? It would help. So you're talking about basically what the layperson would call an ID card, something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. for every patient in order to scale up the system for the kind of vision that everyone's and, talking and about here. Let's take the question first to the side arguing for the motion. Right. Who would like to take that? I don't think it's necessary, but I don't think it's a bad idea. You can have your, all your banking information on a little card. Robert, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, what's essential is that we have everyone's electronic information available to every physician and hospital at the point of contact. Unfortunately, we're a long way away from that. We disagree on how likely it's going to be. I think a small car with a small amount of information won't be enough. You need to have that information. You need to know whether my dad had his vaccine or not. And that requires every physician. Interconnectivity is not going to be enough. 
we need to actually drive a single national IT system like we have ATMs. Oh, come, let's hear from the other side. Come back to this conference in three years. Everyone will have on their iPhone all their medical record, be able to share it with anyone. It'll be completely interoperable and usable. I think you'd probably even be able to sell some of your information, de-identified or identified, because there's value in that data. I so think the, the, the panel all agrees that actually that's a good thing then. Everybody's... Okay. I want to move on to okay. another question. Hi, Matthew Gardner. And I wanted to go back to the idea of terminal. Uh, terminal, I'm not a doctor, but this is kind of how I see it. Uh, it talks <laughs> about the strength to heal oneself relative to the trauma required to heal. So I'm wondering, while there may be some isolated solutions to heal healthcare, will the system overall be effective soon enough? All right, Zeke, you're saying 2030 you think this is happening. What, what gives you this 2030 confidence? And then I want to let the other side respond to it. That's pretty soon. Well, it's 13 years. Uh, I think we're well on our way to doing two things, changing how we pay and responding to those changes with practices that we know can, uh, if applied, consistently lead to higher quality, lower care. And the real issue here is, are we going to have more payment change and uh, can we... Uh, get more adoption and transferring of those uh, practices. And that's not impossible. Remember, 13 years from now, the people who are coming out of training will be about 45 years old, and they are going to be uh, they are implementing it, and they're going to be the dominant force in the health care system. 13 years ago, we had, we had 30 million Americans who didn't have health insurance. We have made changes that people didn't think we could make. Robert How Brown. many are uninsured today? 12 million? So, Is that the so right number? I, I think that's an amazingly great question. It's the trauma to heal and the trauma of the transition. Had we had healthcare costs parallel GDP for the past 20 years, we'd have 5 million fewer jobs in the United States. We'd probably have a dramatic reduction in hospitals. It would have been very traumatic. We didn't do that. Upton Sinclair said it's very hard to get a person to understand that which will affect their income. And I think that that's the problem that sits in place now. Everyone agrees about the things that need to happen, but when you look at what's really happening, hospitals and physicians are finding ways to consolidate, to raise prices. Drug companies are consolidating to raise prices. The kind of resistance to that pain. Excuse me, Robbie, maybe you haven't looked at the healthcare cost data recently, but contrary to what you just said, since passage of the Affordable Care Act, healthcare costs have been flat as a percentage of GDP. Flat, 17.5% in 2010, 17.5% in 2016. We have seen, actually, a flattening of the healthcare costs. We have not seen the continued increase. We have seen efficiencies in the system, and they are propagating. Okay. The but past Robert, is not prologue to the future. Let Robert respond. And and also, change. I want to take on part of that question was the term soon enough. Will the change come about soon enough? And that's gotten a little bit lost. So, Zeke, you, you and I disagree. I think a lot of the things we saw was having to do with the recession that occurred, the downcrease that happened in cost of labor and other things. That was a one-time effect. Just read about the increases that are going to happen next year. Double digits are happening. The issue is soon enough. And I think what's going to happen is that there's going to be progressive erosion far sooner than our ability to make the change. We'll have to wait for the next recession or something else in our country, and then the crisis will happen. What will that crisis look like? The crisis will look like insurance going away, the government reducing dollars so far that people can't get the care, and I actually believe the possibility that we'll see true disruption from offshore competitors. Response to that dire scenario? Look, we have had flat health care growth because we've had efficiencies, we have not had double digit increase, and we are now eight years after the recession. It's long past the recession. It's because the private market is changing and creating different incentives, because Medicare and Medicaid are changing and creating different uh, incentives, and the hospitals and doctors are responding. Are they responding fast enough for Robbie and myself and Shannon and, and David? No, we'd like them to do it faster. But the change is happening, and when you're shifting a $3.4 trillion ship, that's the fifth largest economy in the world, it's going to take 10 years. But 10 years is not never. But Zeke, what's happened is that Medicare and Medicaid have paid less and less because they have the ability to do that pricing. The, the uh, commercial world is now paying 130% of the cost. They're not going to tolerate it for very long. Something major has to happen, and I believe it will happen through the patient. 
Robbie, and through the Robbie, Robbie again, the data just don't bear you uh, out. Don't agree. Okay, the let me let me let me stop it for a moment. The per person costs on Medicare have come down and are negative. The oh. per person costs okay, on Medicare. Okay, we're we're, are we're negative. getting repetitive, and that's why I want to jump in. I, I want to say this. I want to remind you again that we are taking questions and answers in this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate right now. I'm John Donvan, your moderator, and we have four debaters, two teams of two, debating the motion: the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. Next question, please. Hi, so I'm Laurie Skinner, and this um, question is, in regards to MACRA and other quality incentive or quality metrics, Dr. Pearl, you made the comment that quality may not reduce overall cost. Um, can you please explain, and if it will not impact our current healthcare system, why are we spending all this time measuring it? <laughs> yes, so, could you explain that, Dr. Pearl? I'd love to explain it. Uh, first of all, what I said about macro is cost. it's so complex that I'm not sure that people even understand all of it. The amount of time that it's going to take to provide the data is going to be discouraging. They'll do it to get the payments, but I don't think it'll change the underlying piece that sits in place. So why are we doing it? Because it saves lives. Well, if you move hypertension from 55% where it is in the United States today to 90% where the Geisingers and the Kaisers and the Mayo are at, you lower your chance of stroke by 40%. It doesn't lower total cost. That doesn't oh. lower total Shannon, cost. Okay. Okay. Let's, let, let Shannon break in, please. So, but there's another problem with the quality metrics. A whole heck of a lot of them don't have anything to do with actually improving patients', patients health. They are the metrics that we have. And so I think quality metrics are probably not a bad idea, but let's get the metrics that actually matter to patients' health, and let's not have quality metrics that drive physicians to do things that are actually counterproductive, which is what's happening to many, with many of these metrics. Shannon, do you think the quality uh, movement is going in the direction you just said? I don't think see it. Oh, I think we're going way better from checklist and process to more outcome. I think it's happening. So I can take one more can question. I, can I make two points to this? First of all, Z MACRA is not just about quality. It's got four measures, one of which is quality, but one of which, which is supposed to grow over time, is about resource utilization and getting doctors to focus on resource. The second thing is quality measures are expanding. I'm an oncologist. You're now being required to do preferred chemotherapies, not any chemotherapy you like. You're now being required to measure patient reported outcomes and make sure they're actually getting back to work, feeling better. We are moving exactly in the direction of meaningful outcomes. Not just meaningful health outcomes, but meaningful outcomes to patients. And that is a positive effect. One more question, please. Uh, Julie Wang from Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Finberg and Dr. Emanuel have provided a pretty convincing argument that the new payment initiatives are working and will work. We uh, agree. We agree. We, we'll invite you up here. The bundle payments and the ACO, et cetera. The question that I have, and I would enjoy a healthy debate on, is if all the providers in this country become good at managing risk and become risk-bearing entities, will that solve our fundamental issue and turn the health system around? Let's yep. take the other side first. <laughs> so first of all, I mean, Pearl. these things don't even actually happen until 2019. So I totally disagree that it's had this salutary impact. It's talked about, it's thought about, et cetera. If it actually works, if we're actually able to change it, it will have a very good impact upon the health of the country. I'm just still very skeptical that people will do it. They'll, they'll fill out the check boxes and make the things happen. I don't think they're really going to change the underlying social determinants, the other wellness factors, all the other things that go on, unless everyone is a checkbox, and now you're going to totally swamp the primary care physicians in the United States, for which we already do not have enough of them. Well, you know, your question is a great one. And if everybody did the right thing, we solve another problem. We have a provider shortage. And if everyone does the right thing, all of a sudden we don't need as many doctors as that we, we currently have. So I, I think that, that that's an important piece in all of this. We're, we, in, especially in some rural areas and in underserved areas, trying to find primary care, specialty care is almost impossible, pediatric subspecialists. If we can get docs and the choosing wisely is another example of docs coming forward and saying, let's do the right thing. And you can poke fun at it, but it has improved care and it has come from the bottom up, will allow us to have more providers because we eliminate that unnecessary care. David, wait a second. We don't have a shortage of physicians. We have too many specialists 
and not enough primary care physicians in the United States today. In, in Philadelphia, there's what, seven medical centers that are sitting there. We don't need all those pieces. We need them to come together with enough volume to do things well. That's the change that needs to happen. And I think you're absolutely right. In the rural areas, it's tough to get people to go there. 65% of America lives in rural areas. I understand. Right. No. It's tough to get them to go there. We have a redundancy of specialists, a redundancy of hospitals, and insufficient primary care. We need twice as many primary care. We're not training them, and we're making their lives miserable right now. And that, conc and that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared <laughs> U.S. debate, get away with this? where our motion is the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. You were saying, how can you get away with that? You can with an assertion. You can like address that. it in your uh, closing if you have time. Uh, thanks. <laughs> You've got two minutes, and that's You're how it's going to work. This side. Yeah. <laughs> now we move on to round three. Round three will be closing statements by each debater. They will be brief. They will be two minutes each. Again, the motion is the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. Making her closing statement first, Shannon Brownlee, senior minutes. vice. You said, you said, three, you said three minutes. minutes. <laughs> you said I said three minutes. Yes. <laughs> Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Three and two, and it'll balance it out, maybe. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, do you guys want to? Can you two like vamp for two, another three minutes? minutes? Are you? Would you? Are you going to die if it's if no. it messes you up? Terminal. Yeah. Whoever needs three minutes, take it. <laughs> Try to be as short as possible. If there was a misunderstanding and it's our fault, we'll give you right. that concession. One more count for this side. You must think I'm leaning over there, but I'm really yeah, not. Yeah, we do think no, so. No, I'm really not. Making her closing statement. For the motion, Shannon Brownlee, Senior Vice President of the Lown Institute. Thanks. I think Zeke has kind of painted me and, and Robbie as, as the bad news bears. It's all doomed. Everything's terrible. Everything's lost. And in fact, that's not the way I think. That's not what I believe. I believe we can have a truly great and uniquely American healthcare system. And not because Winston Churchill once said, uh, Americans uh, eventually come to the right answer, but only after trying everything else. We can have a great healthcare system because of all the examples that Zeke and David have brought up. And we can have a great healthcare system, I believe, because of all the physicians I know, and there's three of them in this, on this stage, who, and the nurses, and the uh, physician's assistants, and the pharmacists, and the, 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 um, the regulators. There are all kinds of people in healthcare who absolutely committed to making a better system. The problem isn't a deficit of know-how, and the problem isn't a lack of good intentions. It's what it's going to take to move the entire system. And many of the examples that Zeke offered and, and are dependent on venture capital, they're in, or they're dependent on somebody investing money up front. And I want to see that money return to communities. I want to see that money return to patients. I think that money need, needs to be returned to state, state and local budgets. And that's one of the pieces that we haven't figured out. David has made the point very clearly and very eloquently that the, the health really is going to lie in these social determinants. That health care needs to be reserved for taking care of people when they are sick. But we can prevent a great deal of that by reinvesting that money. And we can't do that right now if it's being sucked up by the health care system. But the really big issue here is this need for a, a radically different system is not going to become a reality until we become honest about what's really wrong with the system. Now, we all know what's wrong with the system. We all know what's wrong with the system out in the audience. But the American public doesn't get it yet. And we need to start talking to them. And I want people to get out of their clinics and out of their hospitals and out of their offices and I want them to start talking to their friends, to their neighbors, to their, to their relatives, even the ones who wrote, voted for the wrong candidate. I want them to start talking at their churches and their mosques and their synagogues about what's really going on in healthcare and what a truly great system could look like. Because if we don't do that, we dishonor the suffering that's still going on. We dishonor the people who are being hurt by the system. So, the gulf between the system that they've described and the system that we have today is so wide that I think you have to vote for the premise. The US healthcare system is terminally broken, but it can and will be fixed. Thank you, Shannon Brownlee.
And that's the motion. The U.S. health care system is terminally broken, making his closing statement against the motion. And, and we will, if you, need to, if you want to take more time, you've been very sportsmanlike about that, and we appreciate it. Zeke Emanuel, Vice Provost of Global Initiatives at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, we just heard Shannon say the U.S. health care system can and will be fixed. I think the debate's over. She's just agreed with our side. Yes, the system underperforms. Yes, the system has got a lot of problems, monumental problems. And this side has been well, has well documented them, not just at this debate, but throughout. That we need strong medicine, we agree. But that does not mean we're terminally ill. There are lots of points of light out there. And one of the important points I wanted to make is in the provider community, among doctors, hospitals, health systems like Geisinger and Kaiser, we have lots of innovation going on out there. And that innovation is not limited to just the big giants who can afford it because they have revenues in the billions of dollars. Small practices are doing it, intermediate hospitals are doing it, and many other groups. That's the first point. The second point is we have a lot of investment from venture capitalists and the smart money developing lots of innovations in areas we have never seen attacked before. Primary care, lots of places like Iora and Village MD and others. Mental health services, we've seen new companies to bring mental health services to people. And as I mentioned, Aspire, end of life care and palliative care, who would have thought 10 years ago you'd have new companies in these spaces to transform the system? Change is happening from below. Those new companies, those practices with new ideas. And it's being propelled from above by payers who are saying, we need to adopt those things and we're going to pay you differently. More and more health systems are being at risk and they're going to change how they pay their doctors to be at risk so that they have a stake in the finances as well as the quality. That's happening in the private side. It's also happening through Medicare. Robbie says, oh, macro is so complicated. It is complicated, but the fact is people have two choices, both choices, whether they go with MIPS or they go with alternative payments, force them to now be cost conscious, to actually be efficient, to get rid of unnecessary care, and to improve their quality. That's the direction of the future. Yes, Robbie says it starts in 2021. That's 10 years before 2030, last I looked. And that means we will have one of the world's best healthcare systems by 2030. Is that too late? We will have squandered a lot of money, all of us agree. But it does mean we can transform. Now let me conclude with one element why I am wildly optimistic about the American healthcare system. It's called the Judgment of Paris. In 1976, there was a battle over the best wines, California versus France, in Paris, France, with Nine out of the 12 judges being from France. California won. California used to produce junk wine, and then it became the world's best. The American healthcare system is going to be exactly like California wine. We're mediocre. Soon we're going to be the world's best. Thank you, Zeke Emanuel. The motion, the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken, and making his closing statement in support of the motion, Robert Pearl. So the Commonwealth Fund last month put out its review of the global health care environment. The United States was number one in cost for the 10th year in a row. We were last amongst the 11 industrialized nations. We are last. It's a huge gap to close. We all agree on where we need to get to. The size of the gap is what we disagree around. We've got to get rid of fee-for-service and move to capitation so physicians have as much incentive to prevent a heart attack and stroke as to treat it. We need to be sure that we have every American with electronic health care record so we can avoid medical error and increase quality. We need to elevate primary care and the number of primary care physicians, get rid of the 15-minute visit and rebalance the ratio, we need to do something effective around drugs, and that's going to have to happen at the federal level. And I'm concerned that the health plans, the hospitals, the major physician societies, the drug companies are all going to oppose this, and we've underestimated that resistance. The problems are great. Costs are growing twice as fast. Small hiatus of time, they're once again growing twice as fast as the ability to pay. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying every year for preventable problems. 
primary care is becoming unsustainable and getting worse. Drug costs continue to rise, but it's not just that. At the end of my father's life, my brother and I got a phone call. He'd had a bleed into his brain. We hopped on a red eye. We flew to Miami. There he was, strapped in his bed, intubated. Out the door was a line of doctors. The ENT doctor wanted to do the tracheostomy. The GI doc put the feeding tube in place. The neurosurgeon take out pieces of his skull. We looked at the x-ray. He's not getting better. We said, thank you for your care, but no thank you. For the next two and a half days, we never saw another physician. There is no fee-for-service code, CPT, ICD-9 code, for compassion. There is no way to get paid in the American healthcare system today to be with a family in its time of greatest grief. The first thing is acknowledging that the system is terminally broken, then having the courage and having the leadership to make the changes, to make it once again, as it should be, the best in the world. I urge you to vote for the motion so that the hard work can begin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert Pearl. And one more time, that motion is the U.S. healthcare system is terminally broken. And here making his closing against the motion, David Feinberg, president and CEO of Geisinger. 25 years ago, my wife and I had our first child, and I was pretty sleep deprived. I was a second year fellow in psychiatry, and I was telling a father, he happened to be a used car salesman. He sold Cadillacs in Las Vegas, but they had brought, he had brought his son. He was a single dad. The mom had left. He brought his son to UCLA because he had his first psychotic break. And I had a very, very small office as a fellow. When you opened the door, I actually had to bend, move the chair so that I could put the chair back after I closed the door. And I thought I was really smart. I'd been trained at great places. And I talked to this dad about neurotransmitters and dopamine and reuptake and anticholinergic and all the things that happen with a first psychotic break. And he looked at me and he said, are you telling me I need to build a room out back? And I started crying because I was sleep deprived. I had a new baby, and I realized that the trajectory in this family's life had changed dramatically. And from that point forward, I said, I'm going to talk to patients in a way they, they understand. I'm going to sure, make sure patients get compassionate care. A few years later, I saw a third grader who had tied yarn around her neck. She actually wrote in a haiku poem that she wanted to tie yarn around her neck and commit suicide. Because the family knew somebody, they were able to get in within three weeks. Picture yourself with a third grader that writes in her haiku poem uh, that she wants to kill yourself and it takes three weeks to get in and that's because you had an in. From that point forward, all I've tried to do is improve access so that every patient could get in the same day. If you strip down what we do, we are simply people caring for people. It's gonna take us, all of us, to change this system. I'm all in. And I hope you will come on the journey with us. Thanks. Thank you, David Feinberg. And that concludes closing statements in this Intelligence Squared US debate. And now it's time to learn which side you feel has argued the best. We want you to go to your phones again and vote a second time to tell us where you stand on this motion. The US healthcare system is terminally broken. And you can once again vote yes, no, or undecided. And I'll get the, the word pretty uh, shortly. I have an iPad up here that uh, will be alive, and uh, we'll have the information pop up. But until that happens, I want to say this about this debate that you just witnessed. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to, for a second time, thank Zeke Emanuel for uh, having inspired the debate. There's a reason we've had you back a second time. <laughs> and, uh, I'm a loud mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I... <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're a very, very spirited debater, but um, your, your book, uh, Prescription for the, for the Future, as I said, inspired Thank this you. debate. But I wanted to let uh, the audience here know that um, we're going to uh, provide copies of that book to the audience. They're on us, and we want to do that as a way of uh, showing... Th thanking you for that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. The other thing I want to say about this debate, as I said at the beginning, is the goal of Intelligence Squared to... Uh, to really show that there's a way for people to disagree, but disagree in a way that shed, sheds light and that can take place within a framework of civility and mutual respect. And as fierce as the battle was on this stage, there wasn't a single moment when you doubted that whether these debaters respect one another. They surely do, they surely show that. And what you demonstrated is something I think that we can all applaud. Thank you very much for what you did. 
And then the, the other entity I want to I want to acknowledge is the Mayo Clinic and this conference, the Transform Conference, has been such a spectacularly good partner for us. They worked very very closely with us in figuring out what to debate, what this debate should be about. It, it went through a lot of different ideas and a lot of research and a lot of discussions back and forth. It was all constructive every step of the way. We learned from them. I think that they learned from us. And I really feel that this is one of the most exciting debates we've ever put on as a result. It was a pleasure to be doing it in front of all of you. So thank you so much to the Mayo Clinic and the Innovation Conference and Transform for having us. So it just hit my iPad. The votes are in. Here's how it works. You voted twice. It's the difference between the first vote and the second vote. Whoever went up the most uh, who will be named our winner. The motion again, the US healthcare system is terminally broken. On the first vote on that, 42% of you agreed with the motion, 34% of you disagreed, and 24% were undecided. Those were the first results. Let's look at the second result. In the second result, the team arguing for the motion, the US healthcare system is terminally broken. From their first vote was 42%. Their second vote was 45%. They picked up three percentage points. That is now the number to beat. Let's see the team against the motion. Their first vote was 34%. Their second vote was 51%. They pulled up 17 percentage points. That's what it takes. The team arguing against the motion, the US healthcare system is terminally broken our winners. Congratulations to them. Thank you for me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.